Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students and welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Dr. Vakeshwari Deswal, a professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. We are doing this course on Substantive Criminal Law. Today we will discuss Lesson 5 which deals with General Exceptions to Criminal Liability. Students, in the previous lesson, we discussed what amounts to a general exception, what entitles an accused to exemption from criminal liability. In that, we started with a discussion on what is mistake and what is a mistake of fact and what is a mistake of law and which one is eligible for exemption from criminal liability. So it is only a mistake of fact and under no circumstances can mistake of law or ignorance of law be an exemption from criminal liability. Let us now see what the law says about this. Section 14 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita says, Act done by a person bound or by mistake of fact believing himself bound by law. So this deals with mistake of fact. What it says? Nothing is an offence which is done by a person who is or who by reason of a mistake of fact and not by reason of mistake of law. So you see the law categorically states that is on, it is only mistake of fact which is excusable as a defence under the law. Mistake of law is never available as a defence. Then the next condition is good faith. Good faith in law, how do we ascertain the bona fides of a person? By seeing whether a person has exercised due care and caution, which is expected of any reasonable person to exercise. So, nothing is an offence, that is it is an absolute defence, which is done by a person who is or who by reason of mistake of fact and not by reason of mistake of law in good faith, believes himself to be bound by law to do it. Now there are two illustrations to section 14 which further clarify this. The illustration A, it says, A, a soldier fires on a mob by the order of a superior officer in conformity with the commands of the law. So here, is A guilty of any offence? The answer is no. Why? Because he did something which he believed that he was bound by law to do. But then again, here what is important is, if the superior commands his subordinates to do an illegal act, are they bound by law to do it? No one can be compelled to obey the illegal orders of their superiors. That is why in this illustration what it says, A, a soldier fires on a mob, by the order of his superior officer in conformity with the commands of the law. <clears throat> so when we say in conformity with the commands of the law, it means that the superior has given a legal order, something which the subordinate is bound to follow. So by doing that, has A committed any offence? No, because he believes that when the superior has commanded him to do something, he is supposed to do it. Illustration B, A. An officer of a court being ordered by that court to arrest Y and after due inquiry believing Z to be Y arrests Z. A has committed no offence. Now why is A not guilty of any offence here? Because what is the language it says? A is an officer of the court. He has been ordered by that court to arrest Y. So now A being an officer of court is legally bound to arrest Y. Now what he does, after due inquiry believing Z to be Y, arrests Z. 
So, when it has been stated that after due inquiry, it means we cannot question the bona fides of the officer of the court. So, after A has exercised due diligence and thereafter he believes Z to be Y and he arrests Z, he cannot be held guilty of wrongful confinement. Why? Because he has done under a mistake of fact. He has done an offence which will not be an offence. Why? Because he was be, will be granted an exemption under section 14 of the BNS which is mistake of fact and it was a bona fide mistake of fact. Coming to the next provision, section 17 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. What it says is, act done by a person justified or by mistake of fact believing himself justified by law. Now, the person he believes that he is justified by law. He may be under a mistaken impression as to existence of facts, but here the mistake is only of fact, not of law. What it says? Nothing is an offence which is done by any person who is justified by law or who by reason of a mistake of fact and not by reason of mistake of law in good faith believes himself to be justified by law in doing it. Look at the illustration. A sees Z commit what appears to A to be a murder. A in the exercise to the best of his judgment exerted in good faith of the power which law gives to all persons of apprehending murderers in the act seizes Z in order to bring Z before the proper authorities. Why did he do that? Because he believed that Z was doing something which would have amounted to a murder. So here A has committed no offence though it may turn out that Z was acting in self-defence. So here why would A be protected? Because to the best of his judgment exerted in good faith, his bona fides cannot be questioned here and he has acted under a bona fide mistake of fact. So, that gives him an exemption from criminal liability. What is the second exception, second condition that accords exception from criminal liability? Now, we will be talking about judicial acts and executive acts. Students, an independent and impartial judiciary is the backbone of any democracy. Judges, they need to act fearlessly and independently of any fear or pressure in order to discharge their judicial function of administration of justice. With this objective, we have provisions under different acts which accord protection to judges for acts done by them in furtherance of their judicial functions. Section 15 and Section 16 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita afford protection against criminal liability to judges for acts done by them while acting judicially and to those who execute the judgment or orders of the court. What are the related provisions? Section 1 of the Judicial Officers Protection Act protects them from civil liability. It lays down that no judge, magistrate, justice of the peace, collector or other person acting judicially shall be liable to be sued in any civil court for any act done or ordered to be done by him in the discharge of his judicial duty whether or not within the limits of his jurisdiction provided that he at the time in good faith believed himself to have jurisdiction to do or order the act complained of. So, error of jurisdiction if it is bona fide it is excused from civil liability. Then no officer of any court or other person bound to execute the lawful warrants or orders of any such judge, magistrate, justice of peace, collector or other person acting judicially shall be liable to be sued in any civil court for the execution of any warrant or order which he would be bound to execute within the jurisdiction of the person issuing the same. Then we have one more provision. Section 3 of the Judges Protection Act 1985 
it provides certain more protections to judges and magistrates. It lays down that no court shall entertain or continue any civil or criminal proceeding against any person who is or was a judge for any act, thing or word committed, done or spoken by him when or in the course of acting or purporting to act in the discharge of his official or judicial duty or function. But the above protection shall not debar or affect in any manner the power of the central government or the state government or the Supreme Court of India or any high court or any other authority under any law for the time being in force to take such action whether by way of civil, criminal or departmental proceedings or otherwise against any person who is or was a judge. So you see all these provisions they have been enacted so as to enable our judiciary to act in a fearless manner. Under section 15 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, act of a judge when acting judicially has been exempted from criminal liability. What it says is that nothing is an offence which is done by a judge when acting judicially in the exercise of any power which is or which in good faith he believes to be given to him by law. So here again what is important is good faith. Then section 16 of Bharatiya Nyay Sahita act done pursuant to judgment or order of court. What it says is nothing which is done in pursuance of or which is warranted by the judgment or order of a court. If done, while such judgment or order remains in force is an offence notwithstanding, the court may have had no jurisdiction to pass such judgment or order provided the person doing the act in good faith believes that the court had such jurisdiction. So again, important is acts which are done in good faith. Then, Section 2, Clause 5 of the BNS defines court to denote a judge who is empowered by law to act judicially alone or a body of judges which is empowered by law to act judicially as a body when such judge or body of judges is acting judicially. Thus, court does not only refer to the place or building where judges discharge their judicial functions, it refers to the person or persons who administer justice. A judge performing merely administrative functions is not a court of justice. There is a leading judgment. In Delhi Judicial Service Association, Tis Hazari Court, Delhi vs. State of Gujarat, the apex court laid down certain guidelines to be followed while arresting judicial officers. See, this is important in view of the paramount necessity of preserving the independence of judiciary and at the same time ensuring that infractions of law are properly investigated. So, judges they need to act fearlessly but of course within the limits of law. So if they are acting in the fulfillment or discharge of their functions bona fide, they need to be provided a safety cover. But then again what is protected is only legal acts, not illegal acts. Next exception to criminal liability that we will be talking about is accident. Section 18 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita deals with accident in doing a lawful act. What it says, nothing is an offence which is done by accident or misfortune and without any criminal intention or knowledge in the doing of a lawful act, in a lawful manner, by lawful means and with proper care and caution. So what is important is that exemption is awarded to only those acts which are done by accident or misfortune. Secondly, there should not be any criminal intention or knowledge behind such act. And thirdly, it should be a lawful act in a lawful manner by lawful means. And lastly, 
what is required is proper care and caution should have been exercised that is it is protecting only bona fide accidents anything which just happened by chance despite exercising due care and precaution so that is something which is to be protected under the law look at the illustrations a is at work with a hatchet the head flies off and kills a man who is standing by here if there was no want of proper caution on part of a his act is excusable and not an offence see if he had not exercised proper precautions if the head of the hatchet was low if he knew that was loose if he knew that see such an accident there is a possibility of such an accident happening because it is not sufficiently tight the head of the hatchet then in such cases he would be held guilty for a negligent act but in this case when he has exercised proper care and precaution suddenly the head of the hatchet flies and it hits a person and he kills a person now this accused person he neither had the intention of killing that person who was standing nearby he neither had the knowledge that such an accident will happen it was just a mischance so in such cases the accused can be absolved of his criminal liability so to claim the benefit of accident what has to be shown that the act in question was without any criminal intention or knowledge the act was being done in a lawful manner by lawful means and the act was being done with proper care and precaution so what this section does it it exempts the doer of an innocent or lawful act in an innocent and lawful manner from any unforeseen result that may ensue from an accident or misfortune if either of these elements is wanting the act will not be excused on the grounds of accident so if you do something which is not lawful or if you don't exercise proper care and precaution and somebody dies the law is not going to save you the law will not grant you the benefit of any exception in order to get the benefit of exception all these conditions that is accident or misfortune without any criminal intention or knowledge lawful act in a lawful manner by lawful means and presence of bona fides these four essentials are an absolute must moving on to the next exception which is necessity see necessity is a ground of exception from criminal liability because there is a common law proverb quod necessitatas non habet legem what does it mean it means that necessity knows no law in every law there are some things which when they happen a man may break the words of the law yet not break the law itself and such things are exempted out of the penalty of the law and the law privileges them although they are done against the letter not the spirit of law breaking the words of law is not breaking the law so long as intent of law is not broken this was an observation in one of the judgments so whenever necessity forces a man to do an illegal act such act cannot be termed as a voluntary act such an act is not done willfully but out of compulsion in order to prevent some other harm now there's a leading judgment on this issue there was this case r versus dudley and stephens now this is an old judgment an english case what had happened in this case that there was a shipwreck and there were four sailors who were cast away there was a lifeboat on which these four people they were floating around the high seas there was no help in sight their food and rations had all run out they somehow managed to hunt a turtle they survived on the flesh of that survival of that turtle they were having salty water i mean and ultimately it was evident that he could not survive any more no help was also in sight so the three of the able bodied sea sea persons there they decided that there was one boy who was a young lad of 17 years he was not married he did not even have a family to take care of and he was in a very weak condition also and he was the most likely to die amongst these four if no help came about 
so the other three people they decided that see if his life could be of use to us so it would be better so let us kill him and feed him on his flesh till the time any help comes by so accordingly these people they killed him and they tried to eat him but the very next day they were spotted by a ship they were helped they were carried ashore and they were because in a very very emaciated condition so they had to be hospitalized and then eventually they were put upon trial for killing of that young boy okay public opinion was divided there were some people that see these people they were driven by necessity to cause the death of that other person but on the other hand what the judiciary observed was that see there cannot be no amount of necessity that can justify the voluntary killing of a human being and that to in order to save yourselves so these people they were not given the benefit of this exception of necessity section 19 of the bharatiya nyay sanhita incorporates this law relating to necessity what it says act likely to cause harm but done without criminal intent and to prevent other harm the law says nothing is an offense merely by reason of its being done with the knowledge that it is likely to cause harm if it be done without any criminal intention to cause harm and in good faith for the purpose of preventing or avoiding other harm to person or property so what is required here the act should be done with the knowledge that it is likely to cause harm but there should be no intention to cause harm see they have the knowledge but they don't intend to bring about the forbidden consequences the act should be done in good faith and what should be the objective not to cause harm but the objective should be to prevent or avoid other harm it could be to person or to property explanation the explanation appended to the section says it is a question of fact in such a case whether the harm to be prevented or avoided was of such a nature and so imminent as to justify or excuse the risk of doing the act with the knowledge that it was likely to cause harm so whether it was sufficient or not necessity was it so so necessary or not this is a question of fact what do you mean by question of fact it means that whether it was so necessary or not is some or not is something which will be determined on the basis of facts and circumstances of each and every case there cannot be an objective yardstick to determine that it has to be decided by the courts on the basis of the peculiar facts and circumstances of each and every case as and when they are brought in front of the court see there are two illustrations that further explain this uh, principle of necessity a the captain of a vessel suddenly and without any fault or negligence on his part finds himself in such a position that before he can stop his vessel he must inevitably run down a boat b with 20 or 30 passengers on board unless he changes the course of his vessel and that by changing his course he must incur risk of running down a boat c with only two passengers of on board which he may possibly clear here if a alters his course without any intention to run down the boat c and in good faith for purpose of avoiding the danger to passengers in the boat b he is not guilty of an offence though he may run down the boat sea by doing an act which he knew was likely to cause that effect if it be found as a matter of fact that the danger which he intended to avoid was such as to excuse him in incurring the risk of running down the boat sea so by choosing a lesser harm he tries to avoid the greater harm so in such cases the defence of necessity is applicable illustration b a in a great fire pulls down houses in order to prevent the conflagration from spreading he does this with the intention in good faith of saving human life or property 
here if it be found that harm to be prevented was of such a nature and so imminent as to excuse A's act, A is not guilty of the offence. So, here again it is to be seen on the basis of the peculiar facts and circumstances of each and every case that is whether the damage that was caused was so necessary in order to prevent a even greater harm that the law can accord them justification or grant them uh, an excuse from criminal liability or not. So, this all depends upon the facts and circumstances. The next exemption which a person can claim from criminal liability is immaturity of age and understanding. Sections 20 and 21 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita grant exemption from criminal liability for acts done by children of immature age and understanding. These sections are reflective of the constitutional commitment towards the protection of children found in articles 15 clause 3 and 39 clause E. Article 15 3 of the constitution allows the state to make special provisions for children. Article 39 clause E is a directive principle of state policy aimed at safeguarding the tender age of children against abuse. First we will talk about Section 20 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita which talks about acts of child under 7 years of age. The law says nothing is an offence which is done by a child under 7 years of age. So, you see the language of the law. It says nothing is an offence which means there is an absolute exemption from criminal liability and then it says which is done by a child who is below 7 years of age. A child below 7 years of age is considered in law to be doly incapax. That is one who is incapable of knowing what he is doing. So, when a child is not aware of the nature of his act or the consequences, reasonable and probable consequences that his act may entail, we cannot punish children for doing something which they are not aware of, which they do not know that it is wrong or what are the damages that can result from it. So, what section 20 prescribes is the doctrine of doli incapax, which is a Latin term meaning incapable of evil. Doli incapax is used in law to describe a person who is incapable of having a criminal intent or malice and those that lack sufficient discretion or intelligence to distinguish between right and wrong. So, doli incapax is a type of conclusive and irrebuttable presumption according to which children of tender age are deemed incapable of forming the necessity intent to commit a crime. So, this is a conclusive presumption, this is an irrebuttable presumption. Uh, the prosecution is not even allowed to lead any evidence to displace this presumption because this is conclusive and irrebuttable because children of tender age they need to be protected and nourished, they cannot be subjected to criminal proceedings of any kind. So, that that is why children below 7 years they are exempted from criminal liability. Then section 21 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita, this talks about acts of a child above 7 and under 12 of immature understanding. So, what section 20 provides is an absolute immunity whereas, what section 21 provides is a qualified immunity. See what it says, nothing is an offence which is done by a child above 7 years of age and under 12 years of age who has not attained sufficient maturity of understanding to judge the nature and consequences of his conduct on that occasion. So, while children below 7 years of age have an absolute immunity from criminal liability, Children between 7 to 12 years of age have a qualified immunity. This is a rebuttable presumption. This is not a conclusive presumption. For a child 
between 7 to 12 years of age, it is up to the prosecution to prove that the child had attained sufficient maturity and understanding so as to know the nature of the act that the child was doing or what the reasonable and probable consequences could ensue from such actions. So, in such cases, if the prosecution succeeds in proving that the child had sufficient level of maturity and understanding, the child were rational enough to understand what the child was doing, then in such cases, the child child can also be held criminally liable. So, section 21, it provides a qualified immunity to children between the ages of 7 to 12, a child above 7, but below 12 years of age is presumed to be doli capax, that is one who is capable of having criminal intent and malice. The presumption of doli capax is a rebuttable presumption and the defense needs to prove the absence of sufficient maturity of understanding to judge the nature and consequences of his act. This presumption may be rebutted by strong evidence of a mischievous discretion. There must be proven capacity in the minor for commission of crime and an understanding of the consequences. So, here the kind of proven capacity in the child that we are talking about, here it is regarding the physical consequences, not the penal consequences, because see we do not have to show that the child was aware that okay, this is a crime which will be punishable under the law, maybe I could be held guilty. What we are required to prove is, did the child have that much of a rationality as to understand that if I am going to do this act, these would be the physical consequences on the other person or the property or any other thing. So, if the child was aware of the consequences which would naturally flow from his actions, only the physical consequences, then the child can be held guilty. After immaturity of age and understanding, now we move on to the next available exemption from criminal liability which is unsoundness of mind. See unsoundness of mind is a good defense to criminal liability because in criminal law, mens rea, guilty intention, it plays a very important role. So, when a person is incapable of understanding the nature or consequences of his or her action, so even if you punish that person, the punishment is not going to serve any purpose because the person is not in a position to comprehend why the person is being punished or that the person is being punished at all. So, a person who is incapable of knowing what he has done or what is happening to him, such persons of unsound mind, they are to be exempted from criminal liability. Section 22 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita deals with act of a person of unsound mind. The law says, nothing is an offence which is done by a person who at the time of doing it. So, see what we are talking about here is insanity should prevail at the time of the commission of the offence. So, it says nothing is an offence which is done by a person who at the time of doing it by reason of unsoundness of mind. So, unsoundness of mind is necessary to be proven in this case. It is for the defence to prove that yes, the accused was suffering from insanity at the time of commission of the offence in order to claim the benefit of this exemption. Is incapable of knowing the nature of the act or that he is doing what is either wrong or contrary to law. So, what is required is that it should be proven that the accused was incapable of knowing what he was doing, that is what is the nature of the act or that what is he is doing is either wrong or it is contrary to law. Suppose a person is suffering from unsoundness of mind, okay. he sees uh, a person lying and he because of his unsoundness, he believes the head of that person to be a pitcher of water and he takes a big stick and he puts a, and he gives a blow on that head believing that the pitcher will break into pieces or suppose there is a person, he believes that he is chopping vegetables whereas actually he chops the fingers of a person believing that he is just chopping lady fingers. So, what happens in such cases even though the person has done the act, but it is his condition of mind or because it is an illness which does not 
make him which does not allow him to understand what he is doing so such a person is not aware of the nature of his actions neither is he aware of the consequences suppose there is a person who chops the head of uh, away from the torso of a sleeping man and then he exclaims in glee that now see it will be a great fun to see this head searching for its torso now this person he does not know he cannot understand that moment you have severed a head from the torso there is no life in either the head or the torso and the head is not going to search for the remaining body but because a person is incapable of knowing the nature he is also incapable of understanding the consequences of his action so in such cases even if you are going to punish the person what is the purpose that it is going to serve there was a leading case ashiruddin ahmed versus king emperor that was an old case what happened in that case a man he was a devout muslim and who believed in the existence of allah and he used to offer his prayers regularly so he believed that in a dream allah had commanded him to sacrifice the thing that was the closest to him to allah so accordingly the next day he took his minor son to the mosque he bathed his son he lay his son on a stone in front of the mosque took out a concealed dagger and he slit the throat of his son and he allowed his son to bleed to death after some time he saw a policeman and another person there so he took that other person aside and he said that i have done this because i was commanded by allah to do it but then he took that person aside to tell him it means that he knew that what he had done was legally wrong although his beliefs could not make him understand that what he did was actually wrong morally wrong but he knew it was legally wrong because he tried to conceal this fact from the policeman who was there so in such cases this person was not allowed to take the plea that he was not aware of the nature and consequences of his actions why nature and consequences he knew he did not believe that he was doing something wrong but he knew that what he was doing was contrary to law and that is why he tried to conceal his offense so in such cases defense of insanity it cannot be allowed so what are the essential ingredients to claim unsoundness as a defense to criminal charge unsoundness of mind first a person suffering from unsoundness of mind is non compos mentis what does that mean it means one who is not of sound mind compos mentis means a composed mind non compos mentis means not a composed or not a sound mind non compos mentis means not having control or composure over one's mind so a person thinks something else but his thoughts they are not strong enough to regulate his actions then unsoundness of mind may be temporary such as in case of lunatics it may be permanent idiocy it may be natural or supervening it may be by birth or by illnesses for example schizophrenia and sometimes also by extreme consumption or addiction to alcohol or drugs a person suffering from unsoundness of mind cannot control his will or regulate his conduct such persons are mentally incompetent to understand their actions or judge properly the repercussions of their acts therefore they cannot be held legally responsible for their actions punishment serves no purpose in case of such persons as they are incapable of understanding why they are being punished or that they are being punished at all persons of unsound mind who commit a criminal act are a source of threat to the society and to their own selves however punishment cannot reform them so they are to be placed either in safe custody or delivered to some relative or friend or be kept in an asylum section 367 to 378 of bhartiya nagrik suraksha sanhita 2023 lays down the provisions for treatment inquiry trial custody care detention and release of persons suffering from unsoundness of mind next what is required is that the person should be of unsound mind at the time when he commits the offense so unsoundness of mind should exist at the time of commission of the offense 
the crucial point of time for ascertaining the state of mind of accused is the material time when the offence takes place. If the accused is at that crucial moment found to be labouring under such a defect of reason as not to know the nature of the act he was doing or that even if he knew it did not know it was either wrong or contrary to law then section 22 applies. The state of mind which entitles the accused to avail the benefit of section 22 of BNS is to be established from the circumstances which preceded, the circumstances which attended and the circumstances that followed the crime. So, we have to see what was the status of that person immediately before the crime, at the time of the crime, what was the manner in which he committed it and subsequently after the crime. There was a case in which a husband and wife, they were fighting, there were lots of noises coming out of the room, the man locked the door from inside and he beat his wife and then he took a knife and he stabbed her multiple times and thereafter when people knocked the door, he opened the door and he made no effort to either conceal the weapon of offence or to conceal the dead body and he kept just standing there staring at her. He did not realise what he had done. So, in such cases when it was proven before the course that this person he had an history of mental illnesses, moreover his conduct before the crime at the time of the commission of the crime even if he wanted to kill her, he need not have given so many multiple injuries, he just kept muttering something, he kept stabbing her and after that also he did not make any effort to conceal the body or to conceal the weapon of offence. All this shows that he was not aware that what he was doing was wrong or contrary to law or that at all he knew what he was doing whatever he did in a fit of rage when unsoundness had supervened. Okay. So, what is to be seen is the state of mind of the accused at the time of commission of the offence. But the duty lies on the defence. See, whenever the defence wants to take the benefit of any exception, it is the responsibility of the defence to prove the existence of those peculiar circumstances which entitle the accused person to avail the benefit of any exception. So, there is a duty on defence to prove the unsound state of mind of accused at the time of commission of the offence. One who is subject to recurring fits of insanity will be entitled to exemption from criminal liability only if he was subjected to such a fit at the time of commission of the offence. If he was capable of understanding the nature and consequences of his actions at the time when he committed the offence, he would not be entitled to protection of section 22 and would be liable to punishment. See, there are people who are subjected to recurrent fits of insanity. So, there are people, what happens to them? For some days they are perfectly fine, for some days they might be under a fit of insanity. So, the crucial time for determining the eligibility to avail exception is what was the state of mind at the time when he committed the offence. Suppose a person commits a crime when he is in a perfectly stable sta state of mind. After that he has a fit of insanity. So, he is not eligible to exception, he is not eligible to any protection. But if at the time when he is apprehended, he is suffering under a fit of insanity, so what will happen? The law will apprehend him, send him to an asylum, we will wait for him to regain his composure or sanity. Because a person can be allowed to stand trial only when he is in a fit position to defend himself or to provide his own side of the story. So, that is why the person will have to stand trial and for that we will have to wait till the time he regains his sanity, but he will not be eligible to exemption from criminal liability because the law protects insanity which supervenes only at the time of the commission of offence if it prevailed prior to or subsequent to the commission of the offence, but at the time of the commission of the offence if the person was of sound mind, he is not entitled to the benefit of this exception. Thereafter, the defence has to prove incapability in the accused person to know the nature of his act or that what he is doing is wrong or contrary to law. The words incapable of knowing clarifies that an accused has to prove 
that he was rendered incapable of understanding his actions owing to unsoundness of mind. The capacity to know a thing is quite different from what a person knows. So, whether he knew the nature of his actions or not is immaterial because what is protected under section 22 is an inherent or organic incapacity and not a wrong or erroneous belief which, which might be the result of perverted potentiality. So, this incapability may be due to arrested development of the mind, it may be due to sudden fit of insanity or delusion or any other medically accepted ground. So, what is the test of unsoundness? McNaughton rules are principles expounded in the year 1843 by a panel of 15 judges in the House of Lords in response to five hypothetical questions asked by the Lord Chancellor to understand the application of law to determine the liability for crimes committed by mentally challenged people. These principles lay down a standard of test uh, standard to test the criminal liability of persons of unsound mind. The McNaughton rules also known as the right wrong test required the acquittal of defendants who could not distinguish right from wrong. So, what is, was to be tested was the incapacity on part of accused person to distinguish what is right from what is wrong. Then, in 1929, the District Court of Columbia developed the irresistible impulse test which allowed a jury to inquire whether the accused suffered from a diseased mental condition that did not allow him or her to resist an insane impulse. So, whether that person given uh, of such a nature that he would give in to his impulses or were his impulses so strong as to overpower him. So, what we had to see was whether mentally he lacked the capacity to control his urges or impulses. So, this required a jury's determination that the accused was suffering from a mental disease and that there was a causal relationship between the disease and the act. When we talk about a causal relationship that is the act was owing to the disease that owing to that disease the person he gave in to his irresistible urges which resulted in the criminal act. Thereafter in the year 1954 the Durham rule was adopted by an American court in the case of Durham versus US popularly known as the product test. This rule lays down that an accused is not criminally responsible if his unlawful act was the product of mental disease or mental defect. This rule perpetuated the dominant role of expert testimony in determining criminal responsibility instead of a jury because see jury consists of a group of people and people might be swayed away by their own feelings. So, that is why what is required is an objective expert opinion. However, in subsequent cases, the courts overturned this rule and it was rejected by the federal courts because of its broad spectrum and range which helped people such as alcoholics and drug addicts to seek exemption from criminal liability. In India, Courts usually rely on the following to ascertain the state of mind of accused at the time of offence. So, in order to decide whether a person is eligible for exemption from criminal liability on the grounds of insanity, what are the factors that the Indian courts look at? Let us talk about them. One presence or lack of motive. If a person has a motive and then that person feigns unsoundness to commit a crime, now that is something which cannot be allowed to be taken as a defense against criminal liability. But if there is a lack of motive that definitely strengthens the defense version that see this accused person he had no motive and still he committed this act. So, maybe there is a possibility that there was some unsoundness prevailing. 
deliberation and preparation. A person of unsound mind cannot deliberate, cannot prepare. So, if it is a deliberately planned and uh, executed crime with full preparation, so of course, it cannot be said that it was the uh, act of a person of unsound mind. Then, what is the manner in which the crime was committed? A crime committed in a systematic manner which shows that it was planned and thereafter the weapon of offence was also hidden. So, what does all this show? The manner of commission of the crime, a person of unsound mind cannot plan and execute his actions so swiftly and be able to conceal his acts, to conceal his tracks. So, in such cases, the manner in which the crime was committed has a great bearing on the question whether the accused was suffering from unsoundness at the time of commission of offence or not. The next would be nature of weapon used. See, if at the time of commission of the crime, the person who claims insanity picks up an offence which is easily available, which is uh, near him or something which is usually found on his person and uses such offence to execute the crime. We can say that maybe it just happened on the spur of the moment when the person was not able to control his impulses or because the person was of unsound mind. But if a person goes to some extent to procure a knife or a gun, then makes an effort to conceal that and then whips out that revolver at the opportune moment to strike his opponent, can we say that the person was suffering from unsoundness? The answer would be no. Then attempt at concealment of the dead body, weapon of offence or other telltale signs. See, one who is suffering from unsoundness of mind would not care to cover his tracks because when the person does not know that what he has done is wrong or what the consequences of his actions are, obviously the person does not even know that it is something which entails criminal liability for which he might be apprehended by the police or tried by the courts. So, such a person will not make any efforts to conceal the crime that has been committed by such person. So, if a person does that, if a person tries to conceal his tracks, conceal the dead body uh, or to conceal the weapon of offence, it means that the person was a person of perfectly sound mind. If the accused makes any efforts to avoid detection or evade apprehension by the authorities, it means that the person is aware of the fact uh, that the act is wrong and it is contrary to law. So, how can we say that the person is suffering from unsoundness of mind? Similarly, what else do the courts take into consideration? What was the conduct of the appellant immediately before the incident, at the time of incident and shortly after the incident? See, subsequent conduct of the appellant and his conduct during the trial of the case. Now, these are also important determining factors to see whether the accused was of unsound mind at the time of crime or not. Then, previous history, if any, of attacks of insanity, hospitalization or treatment of insanity. So, all this would have to be produced by the accused before the court if he wants to take the plea of insanity. Family history of unsoundness because sometimes hereditary does play a part. So, if the accused can succeed in proving before the courts that see there was some sort of a hereditary illness which might have supervened in him at the time of commission of offence, then the law can give him some defence. So, before we complete this discussion on unsoundness of mind, we have to understand what is the difference between legal insanity and medical insanity because what the, the law protects is only legal insanity. It is only legal insanity which is a ground for defence. See, medical insanity in order to be taken as a ground for exemption must also be legal insanity. See, medical insanity is when a person is suffering from any kind of unsoundness of mind at any time. Okay, that is something which the doctors have to prove, something which medical opinion will prove whether this person is medically insane or not. Legal insanity is insanity at the time of the commission of offence. So, that is something which is proven in the courts. That is what was the conduct of the accused person immediately prior to the offence at the time of commission of the offence or subsequent to the commission of the offence. So, what has to be proven in order to take the benefit of exemption from criminal liability is that there was insanity which is a medical insanity, but that medical insanity was present in the accused 
at the time of commission of the offence, it is only then that he gets the benefit of legal insanity. Now moving to the next exemption from criminal liability which is intoxication, intoxication or drunkenness as a defence to criminal liability. Section 23 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita talks about acts of a person incapable of judgment by reason of intoxication caused against his will. What does the law read? It says nothing is an offence which is done by a person who at the time of doing it is by reason of intoxication incapable of knowing the nature of the act or that he is doing what is either wrong or contrary to law provided that the thing which intoxicated him was administered to him without his knowledge or against his will. So, what are the essentials to claim the benefit of exemption under section 23? 1. There must be a proven incapacity in the part of accused to know or understand the nature of his actions. There should be incapacity of judgment due to intoxication that should exist at the time of commission of the offence and intoxication should be involuntary. See, basis for not accepting voluntary intoxication as a defence is summed up by the Latin phrase Q pecet ebrius lua sobrius which means that he who does wrong when drunk must be punished when sober. See, the law does not give protection to drunkards to consume liquor and then go around committing crimes. It cannot be a defence to claim exemption for a crime which you have done. First, you are drunk and drunk to an extent that you lose control over your actions and then you commit crimes and then you seek to take the benefit of this exception that I did this crime because I was not aware of what I was doing or because I was drunk. So, I lost control over my actions. Law says one who sins when he is drunk should be punished when he is sober. So, what is required is that first is the degree of drunkenness. The person should be intoxicated to an extent so as to deprive him to understand what he is doing and second thing the intoxication should be involuntary. What is involuntary intoxication? That is when the intoxicating substance was administered to the accused without his knowledge or against his will. That is when he was not aware of what he was being offered as a drink, somebody spiked his drunk drink or somebody fraudulently gave him something, uh, administered him, give, gave him an injection of a drug or any such thing which he did not know to be an intoxicating substance. Or second, when the intoxicating substance was administered to him against his will, against his will that is despite stiff resistance from his side. There was a case in which there was uh, a, a policeman who had gone to uh, attend a wedding party along with the other of the uh, other people of the party. They were all drunk, they were indulging in merry making. So, he wanted a particular seat which was occupied by a young boy. He asked that boy to get up and vacate the seat for him. When the boy refused to do so, this man he took out his revolver and he shot at the young boy killing him. During trial he said that I was intoxicated so I did not know what I was doing. But he was not given the benefit of this exception. Why? Because the intoxicating substance was taken by him voluntarily. See there is another provision section 24 which says offence requiring a particular intent or knowledge committed by one who is intoxicated. So, in cases where an act done is not an offence unless done with a particular knowledge or intent, a person who does the act in a state of intoxication shall be liable to be dealt with as if he had the same knowledge. See, it does not talk about the same intention because intention cannot be presumed. It is only knowledge that can be presumed the same knowledge as he would have had if he had not been intoxicated. So, section 24 applies to cases where a specific intent or knowledge is necessary to constitute that offence. So, 24 what it lays down is a rule of presumption in cases of voluntary intoxication.
Thus, except in cases of involuntary intoxication, a person who is intoxicated will be considered to have the same level of knowledge as one who is not intoxicated. So, students, that will be all about this lesson. We will meet you soon with another lecture in which we will be dealing further with the remaining exceptions to criminal liability. Thank you.